All right. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone back to uh, Zoll Center. We're starting our second season uh, now with a little more resident involvement. Um, if, guys, if you don't know me, I'm John. I'm a second year resident uh, here at BI. Um, I'm very grateful to be joined by uh, fantastic uh, co-host, uh, Dr. Mike Mee, who's a cardiology fellow here. Uh, we also have a um, wonderful panel of experts. We have Dr. Jason Matos, uh, coming from non-interventional cardiology. Mm -hmm. uh, we have Dr. Mark Tuttle uh, from interventional cardiology. Uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. Eli Gelfan, who specializes in valvular disease and some imaging findings of those as well. And we have Dr. Lewis Chu, who is um, joining us from cardiac surgery. So I'd like to thank everyone for, for being here. And let's get started. Uh, so our case today, uh, this is a lovely gentleman I saw in clinic. He was a 59-year-old male, history of coarctation of the aorta, who had a surgical repair as a child in 1965. He also has a known bicuspid aortic valve, uh, pulmonary sarcoidosis, currently in remission, and asthma who came in here just for a routine health maintenance exam, uh, no acute complaints. Uh, when I talked to him, he said that he's feeling well and quote, you know, just wanted to check in, make sure everything's okay. Um, on further questioning, he did say that he was feeling, quote, a little bit more or slightly more tired than he was used to. Uh, in particular, he used to play frisbee and jog more and he's really changed those now he prefers to garden and just doesn't have the same energy that he used to. Um, as far as his past medical history, um, he had the coarctation repaired as a child uh, without further issue after. Um, he is bicuspid aortic valve. He last had an echo in 2015 with mild aortic stenosis. Um, as far as you could tell, he was asymptomatic previously. Um, for his pulmonary sarcoidosis, this was diagnosed in 2000, and he ended up having grade two fibrosis, which spontaneously remitted. Uh, notably, he had not seen pulmonary since 2003, um, so around 17 years. And he has mild exercise-induced asthma. Um, his only medication is an albuterol inhaler, which he rarely, rarely, rarely requires. Um, as far as social history, this is Boston, so he is a satellite systems engineer. He's a never smoker and drinks uh, two to three drinks of alcohol per week. No known family history of cardiac disease. Uh, on physical exam, uh, unfortunately, this was a during the COVID epidemic and it was a telehealth visit, so I did not appreciate a murmur on exam. So this Perfect. brings us to, to his chest. <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> Next time, my learning point. <laughs> Um, so as far as clinical decision point number one um, here in the outpatient clinic, if you're listening at home, you can pause um, to think through. Um, as far as our impression in clinic, um, so overall his symptoms are fairly subtle, but certainly concerning given his history, not only of the bicuspid valve with, without an echo in, in over five years, um, but also with a sarcoid, uh, which he's not had follow-up for in the last uh, 15 plus years. Um, so we got a chest x-ray to start, um, which was negative for recurrent sarcoidosis, um, because this is a cardiology talk, not a pulmonary talk. <laughs> uh, and then we also got an echo to evaluate the bicuspid valve. Um, and so quickly, before we dive into um, the results of the echo, just a quick side note on the natural history of aortic stenosis and why in particular we're concerned about that five-year benchmark. Um, so this is really the classic paper um, by Ross and Braunwald in circulation 1968 um, that linked the uh, development of symptoms uh, with uh, mortality and death in patients with aortic stenosis. He found that once it becomes symptomatic of angina, there's roughly five years left to live. Uh, once you have any syncope, it's three years. And once there is any evidence of heart failure due to the aortic stenosis, there's only two. This really underlies the importance of not only screening, but also intervention once symptoms do develop. Um, as far as this patient with a bicuspid valve, uh, I throw it off to Dr. Matos to talk about some screening considerations that we would have for this patient. Oh, thanks. Thanks, John. And I, I also defer to Dr. Gelfand who trained me in all this stuff um, <laughs> when I was a fellow. But, um, you know, bicuspid aortop aortopathy can cause, and th these uh, bullet points represent the issue well, but the bicuspid valve itself with two cusps instead of three those two cusps are subject to more shear forces and there can be more premature calcification of the valves, which can lead to stenosis and also malcoaptation of the leaflets leading to regurgitation. At the same time, those shear forces can lead to dilatation of the aorta, the proximal ascending aorta. And when the aortic annulus and ascending aorta dilates, you can also get malcoaptation of the valve, sort of a functional coaptation where the leaflets just don't reach each other and you can get some aortic regurgitation uh, as well. And, and so when we counsel patients that have bicuspid valves that they are much more likely to require any intervention for a, an aortic valve issue than those with, uh, with three cusps. And the classic teaching, as you can see here in the third bullet point, uh, 
is that once they reach severe, you, they don't, we don't want them to fall off that cliff of the graph that John showed. And so we try to really follow them closely, not just with echoes, but really keeping a close eye on their symptoms. And there's other testing, which we can do, which we'll talk about uh, in a little bit. Um, and so we need to keep an eye on the degree of stenosis, how they're feeling, and then how dilated they, their aorta is. I think that was certainly one of the key learning points for me on this that I feel like I learned in, in like med school and beginning of residency that, you know, they get extra wear and tear. So they, they're usually present like the 50s to 60s rather than 70s to 80s, but I didn't really heard about, you know, the broader aortic pathology. Um, certainly a good learning point. I think uh, uh, the imp one of the other important points here is that the uh, degree of aortic dilatation in p patients with bicuspid aortic valves is not necessarily related to the state of the aortic valve itself. In other words, you can have somebody with a bicuspid valve that's neither significantly stenotic nor regurgitant, nor regurgitant uh, and who has a, a large aortic aneurysm uh, on the background of bicuspid aortopathy. Conversely, we have many patients with severe aortic stenosis that turns out to be bicuspid in nature. We have completely normal aorta, and when they come to Dr. Chu and his colleagues, uh, that aorta is typically left alone. Yeah, they actually, it's not just the uh, hemodynamics of the flow through the aortic valve, but they actually have some molecular differences of you know, out proteinases and elastases in their aorta that predispose them to getting these aneurysms. So Eli's right, you don't necessarily have to have um, severe stenosis for you to have uh, a bicuspid valve with your yeah. One of the things that I learned uh, probably to do a little bit late in my fellowship is, um, you know, when we send patients for a cardiac surgery, say for a bypass surgery, where usually um, no specimens are sent to the lab, but also for valve surgery where valve leaflets are sent to the lab, if it's for pure degenerative disease, I mean, we look at these pathology reports um, and they typically don't contain much useful information, frankly, but with bicuspid aortic valves, especially the ones where uh, parts of the aorta is resected or for, for frank aortic surgery, it's very important to look at the pathology and if something's unclear to really speak with the cardiac pathologist because often the degree of um, uh, of degeneration of the aorta will be very apparent to the pathologist and this will guide your follow-up after surgery in terms of intensity of screening, uh, but also in terms of uh, potentially screening for a genetic mutation. Yeah, so this is uh, his parast parasternal long view of the heart. So John, I don't know if you can put your cursor up here just so they can see, but um, in the top of the screen, you see the right ventricular outflow tract um, that's beating here and below that's a left ventricular cavity, both of which have normal function. You see the mitral valve just below um, John's cursor there. And then to the right, there's the aortic valve that's heavily calcified. It appears like there might be decent leaflet excursion, but you can't really see what's going on on the tips of the leaflet. And what you can see is on the right side that there is some turbulence of flow during systole and then slight bit of turbulence and flow during diastole to consider. So you can't really quantify the aortic stenosis here, but there's probably some aortic, there's some amount of aortic stenosis and there's, it seems a small amount of aortic regurgitation. So here we kind of look at the aortic valve on FOSS, so sort of right down the barrel of the aortic valve. And sometimes when the valve gets this calcified, it's really hard to determine how many leaflets there are, but it looks like there are heavily calcified and there are probably two and it doesn't seem like there's much area for the aortic valve to, uh, to kind of open there. So this is an apical five chamber view that has on your left, the right ventricle on the top of the screen and the top, and the right ventricle in the, your top left of the screen and the left ventricle in your top right of the screen. Um, and, the re and you see the atria below, but the reason it's called a five chamber view is what we're looking at, the turbulence of flow is ejection of blood from the left ventricle into the aorta. And th this picture doesn't say much, but it's the Doppler that we get from using this picture. We can get the velocities across the valve, which you see in the echo reports, which is gonna help us calculate the aortic valve area. When we do aortic valve area and echo, we're not tracing the aortic valve. When the valve's is calcified, any tracing would be far too inaccurate um, and a bit ad hoc. So what we, we, we do a calculation using something called the continuity equation to figure out the aortic valve area. And the way we do that is we measure the diameter of the left ventricular outflow tract in a different view. And we, from there, we calculate the aorta, uh, the um, area of the left ventricular outflow tract. And then we get the flow of the left ventricular outflow tract here. So if we have the area of the LVOT and the flow of the LVOT, and then if you go to the next slide, and then we get the flow across the aortic valve. And then for, with those three pieces of information, we can solve for the aortic valve area.
what you can see here, I always teach about this rule of four and 40. So a peak velocity, you can see um, a couple of V maxes here, both are in, next to the number one and number two in the top of the screen, the top left are four meters per second. And then that corresponds to four V squared, a max peak gradient of around 63, 64 millimeters of mercury. And then the mean gradient, which is sort of the average velocity during systole is uh, 42 millimeters of mercury. So by hitting the four meters per second, uh, peak velocity and the over 40 millimeters mean gradient, that sort of by definition um, is pretty indicative of severe aortic stenosis. And then that can get further confirmed once we calculate the aortic valve area. This is important as we've been talking about his, he, the possibility of having a concurrent aortopathy. His ascending aorta here measures 3.9 centimeters on echo, which is very mildly dilated, but not to the point where we would think he reaches the threshold for concurrent aortic surgery if we were to operate on his aortic valve. When, you, when we first meet patients with bicuspid aortic valve, there are a couple of questions that we should probably ask them, and they relate to the genetics of bicuspid aortic valve disease, which we'll probably talk about a little bit later. But just to mention early, just to plant the seed of this, that while most commonly bicuspid aortic valve disease is isolated, uh, there is uh, a subset of population with a genetic component to, to bicuspid aortic valves with probably an autosomal dominant inheritance where the, both the penetrance and the expressivity are uh, variable. The penetrance is reduced and expressivity is variable. And there's, there's a good association between several syndromes and, and a higher prevalence of bicuspid aortic valves, specifically Marfan syndrome and Lois Dietz syndrome both of which, um, as you know, are um, genetic conditions which involve abnormalities in connective tissue uh, that is abundant in the aorta. And so um, questions related to diagnosis of Marfan syndrome and perhaps referral to a genetics clinic is not a bad idea for patients who um, either, are cl either clearly have symptoms or sy uh, features of these disorders or sort of fulfill some but not all the criteria. And so just to summarize, um, so right now we're looking at the echo report um, that, that I got in clinic, I actually got email about it. Um, so some of the key findings is that mildly dilated ascending aorta that we mentioned, um, confirmation is bicuspid, um, and then again, severe aortic stenosis. Um, if we look down at the bottom of the screen, we have some of the details. Um, so the valve area measured to be 0 0.7, the peak velocity of 4.3, and a mean gradient of 50. Um, and so from the, you know, the resident side of things, um, these are some important numbers to know just in terms of how we grade aortic stenosis. It's really based on the echo findings. In particular, these three measurements are used. Uh, peak velocity is over four, then it's in the severe category if your mean gradient is over 40. And if your valve area is less than one, those are all indicators um, of severity of disease. Uh, as we can see, um, our current patient hits all three of those. Um, so this is certainly um, severe aortic stenosis. Um, so this brings us to clinical decision point number two, uh, in particular, what, uh, what to do at this point. So you can pause again to think through. Um, so when we were thinking through this patient, this patient now is likely uh, symptomatic and certainly severe bicuspid aortic stenosis. So they're most likely going to require intervention. Um, this patient, owing to um, certainly his background as a satellite engineer, was more uh, numerically focused and wanted a little bit more evidence before going forward with intervention. Uh, and so a couple of the tests that we looked at were uh, first a CTA of the chest to further evaluate for aortic um, dilation. Um, given the bicuspid valve, um, as well as some non-imaging stress tests to see is it really is he really symptomatic from the heart or, or potentially some other causes, and we can also go into some of the other rationale for that uh, when we get to it. Um, so this is the CTA uh, uh, overall uh, minimal changes, um, mildly dilated aortic root, um, 39.3. <laughs> well, um, it, 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 for the residents and, and, uh, and other listeners, it, it just a reminder that echocardiography re does report uh, aortic dimensions, but echo should not be used as a sole imaging test to evaluate all segments of the thoracic aorta. Echocardiography is very good at uh, determining the size of the aortic root and proximally ascending aorta, and to some degree, portions of descending aorta as well. Uh, but when you get to the transition between the ascending aorta and the arch, um, there are some blind spots there which are not evaluated by, uh, by a 2D transthoracic echo. So a volumetric test is a very good idea. And your choices really are 
computer tomography or MRI. Uh, they're, they're pretty interchangeable. MRI is a little more expensive and then long test and it's harder to, for the patients to endure, but of course uses no ionizing radiation and uh, uh, no nephrotoxic contrast. I also had coarctation of the aorta repaired in the past. So one of the things that Jason looked for with CTA was whether or not he had uh, reoccurrence of his coarctation, which he did have some narrowing there, but um, you know, dynamic, dynamic, we kind of compared upper and lower extremity blood pressures. There's no um, significant difference there. And kind of alluding to Eli's point before, um, coarctation actually is very closely associated with bicuspid aortic valve also. I think 75% uh, of patients with aortic coarctation also have a how they develop in embryology. Yeah, I actually got the CT for three reasons. One, well, yeah, one to look at the aortic size, two to look for coarct, and actually three, I felt if I was going to send him for surgery, um, I didn't think the chest x-ray was necessarily adequate enough to exonerate whatever sarcoid he may or may not have. So I thought just to make sure we're not missing some really subclinical paren parenchymal lung disease that was going to surprise people in the OR. And since, since we are on the topic of the CT, it's worth mentioning that um, some of the novel uses of CT in aortic valve disease include obtaining the calcium score uh, for the aortic valve. We are getting very used to uh, obtaining uh, coronary calcium scores for the coronary arteries, primarily for risk stratification of, of patients at intermediate risk of coronary artery disease. Um, but you can simply, with very little radiation, obtain a, uh, a CT scan of the aortic valve and quantify the amount of calcium. And it has very good correlation with severity of aortic stenosis in patients in whom other testing is equivocal. Uh, now, it's important to also remember that the cutoffs are different in men and women. Generally, we use uh, a calcium score of about 1,200 and above as a marker of severe AS in women and 2,000 and above for men. So at this point, I guess the decision is, what do we do about a severe AS and does he have symptoms from it? Yeah, so, so I mean, you know, patients, this, this, is, this is a fairly, this is a case of a, a patient who apparently, you know, is, is very well educated and maybe uh, quite attuned to his symptoms. In addition, this is a patient who is reasonably active and so he has really a chance to become symptomatic, but of course, in clinic, as, as, as uh, everyone knows, uh, you know, patients come in all shapes and sizes, and often what happens is this is a slowly progressive disease, and patients gradually adapt to their hemodynamics and do less and less um, every year, almost imperceptibly to them, and sometimes imperceptible to uh, their relatives. And so they come, quote-unquote, asymptomatic, but uh, really on further detailed history, it turns out they really don't do very much. It's helpful to... Um, Put them on a treadmill or exercise bicycle under very controlled conditions uh, to see what their actual functional capacity is measured when measured objectively, what their ECG looks like in response to stress, and what, the, what their hemodynamics, meaning blood pressure and heart rate, look when their um, heart is put under stress in presence of severe aortic stenosis. Now, I, you know, patients who are frankly symptomatic, somebody who comes in with, uh, you know, shortness of breath and severe aortic stenosis or heart failure. Uh, stress test is still contraindicated, so we don't really use stress testing in these patients. To be, they're clearly symptomatic. Obviously, the um, you know the decision should be to uh, replace or repair the aortic valve. But in these borderline cases, stress testing can be very useful. Yeah. So here is here are the uh, um, some of the the, the snapshots. Um, so I think if we're kind of looking on the screen, a couple things to point out. Um, certainly here um, PVCs and also some marked um, ST depressions. And he's had them. Uh, and, and a good number of the images, these are some of the more remarkable ones, especially in the inferior leads, 2, 3, AVF, some market ST depressions, as well as in the, the lateral leads, uh, V4, V5, V6. Uh, and so overall, the test actually had to be terminated early because of the ST changes. He did get up to 9.7 METs, which is um, like a light jog. Um, however, again, significant amounts of activity as well. So it's worth, again, I think it's worth uh, remembering that these stress tests are interpreted a little bit differently from the exercise tolerance tests we obtained for diagnosis of coronary disease. And specifically, ST segment depressions are essentially uniform in patients with severe AS who will go on a treadmill. And this speaks to the very high prevalence of, of ischemia in these patients, although this ischemia is often not due to coronary artery disease, at least epicardial coronary artery disease, but due to the uh, hemodynamic stress on the left ventricle. Of course, this patient's peak gradient across the aortic valve was, uh, I think, 70. So that means for 
any systolic blood pressure that you measure in the arm, the pressure inside the ventricle is 70 millimeters mercury higher. So that exerts incredible stress on the left ventricular myocardium, compresses the vessels in systole, also blunts diastolic flow through the coronary arteries and leads to at least small vessel ischemia. So for that reason, you know, there have been studies of ST segment depressions uh, and response to surgery uh, or respond or need for surgery in the uh, uh, upcoming months to uh, to years, and uh, this finding is extremely non-specific. So, uh, whereas we 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 note these uh, ST segment depressions, they typically do not lead to um, uh, intervention in and of themselves because of the very poor specificity. However, if somebody develops high-grade ventricular tachyarrhythmia, if somebody um, somebody uh, 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 you know, if a patient's blood pressure response is blunted uh, to typically less than 20 millimeters mercury, or if the blood pressure, in fact, drops, or if the exercise capacity is markedly reduced, then we typically use a cutoff of about four METs. This person exercised for 9.7 METs, but if it's less than four METs, these um, are all predictors of poor outcome with, with ongoing observation of medical therapy, and these patients are typically referred for um, an operation. I'm just looking back during the 9.2 METs or 9.7 METs, his blood pressure went from 130 to 132. So his went up two, two million, and actually in, in the middle of the stress test, it had gone down to the 120s. Yeah. So this is a, this is a positive stress test. For it. I just want to emphasize, John. So it's at this point that we sort of have decided, and I called him and said that I think we should move forward with intervention and um, we can show the angiogram. The angiogram is really not more to explain the symptoms. It's more like we're going to do an intervention. So let's see what his coronary anatomy is. So this is an injection of the left main coronary artery and this is a cranial view. We always take multiple different views of the arteries and the angiograms because you're imaging a, a 3D structure really with a 2D modality. And you, you just don't want to miss any eccentric stenosis. So this is why we take multiple different orthogonal views. But uh, it looks like the catheter pops out at the end of the injection there, but what you can appreciate is that in the proximal LED, let's see if I can use any of the annotation tools. It doesn't look like I'm able to, but... Uh, Dark nice. to me is though. <laughs> I'm physically right there. Nice, perfect. So there is a stenosis there in the proximal LED. And I would say it's intermediate. It's, you know, there's still normal flow in the LED, um, but it looks like it's probably 70, 80% stenosis there. Right on, 70%. <laughs> All right, so this now brings us to um, decision point number three. Um, again, a little bit out of order. Um, you can pause, think through what you would do next in this scenario. All right, um, so at this point, uh, just to summarize the patient with um, severe symptomatic AS with concerning findings on the stress test. Uh, I talked about um, not only the EKG changes, but also the blunting uh, of his hemodynamics and borderline area root dilation. So he's gonna likely warrant intervention at this point. Um, and so now it's really a discussion on what is the appropriate intervention for him. And if you go back 20 years or so, um, then it was really, you know, what type of surgical valve do you want? And more recently over the last decade or so, um, uh, TAVRs have really come into play as well. Um, and so I think we'd start by um, throwing it to Dr. Chu. Um, would you mind talking us through when you're counseling patients on um, mecha mechanical valve or on surgical valves, the differences between um, mechanical and bioprosthetics? Yeah, sure thing. I think, you know, the first decision we try to make is when we see these patients these days is whether they are surgical ended or whether they should be referred for TAVR. Um, often it's kind of a multidisciplinary decision between surgeons and cardiologists and the patient as well. Um, and, uh, you know, it used to be when TAVR first came around, it was only very sick patients, very old patients that we thought would do very poorly with surgery that received TAVR. Nowadays, as, you know, the TAVR technology has gotten better and we've become more proficient with doing the procedure, it's being offered to intermediate risk patients and now more recently low risk patients as well. Um, but it's these patients, the low risk patients, and especially the hospital developed patients that are a little bit um, in a gray area as to which intervention is better because a lot of the data that we have, uh, number one, is you know, not very long term. Number two shows some equivalence um, between the two you know, interventions, whether it be surgery or, or TAVR. Um, but I thought this gentleman, because he was you know, pretty young, below 60 years old, because he had a bicuspid valve, um, even before we saw the angiogram that showed the 70% LED stenosis, 
thought that um, you know a surgical valve would be the better choice for him. Um, then the secondary decision comes between you know whether we choose a mechanical valve or a bi bioprosthetic valve for the patients. The benefits of a mechanical valve are that they're much more durable, and basically these valves are made with um, you know carbon and metal with a little bit of cloth for the sewing ring, and their durability can be you know over 30 years uh, of durability. Uh, which for most people um, is sufficient for the rest of their life. Um, whereas the bioprosthetic valves, which, you know, the leaflets are made of uh, either porcine or bovine tissue, um, the durability is less because these valves can get calcifications of the leaflets, they can sometimes get tears of the leaflets, cause either stenosis or regurgitation down the road. The durability of these valves is still pretty good. You know, I think about 15 years, um, you know, 75 to 80% of these valves are still good. At 20 years, it drops down to about 50%. Um, but the key things to remember here is that with, you know, the younger the patient is, the more quickly their bioprosthetic valve degenerates. So as you get down to, you know, the low 50s, 40, 30 years old, um, really a mechanical valve is a better choice for those younger patients. The downside of mechanical valves is that you require anticoagulation. And it used to be for the older generation mechanical valves, that would, would mean a target INR of 2.5 to 3. Now, the majority of us uh, use something called an onyx valve, which because of the way it's designed, um, after three months of, of 2.5 to 3, you can actually drop the iron and gold down to 1.5 to 2. So they require a little bit less Coumadin and are a little bit less prone to developing the bleeding complications of anticoagulation. Um, so it's a little bit less of concern for those patients. Um, but it is something that they have to still remember to take every single day uh, for the rest of the duration of the valve and also get blood checks every once in a while. Um, the mechanical valves also have a better um, opening area, so there's a less likelihood of having a patient prostate mismatch, mismatch, which means that the valve area is not sufficient for the size of the patient. Um, so these are the kind of things that we consider when we decide between mechanical and broad prosthetic valve. Um, there are some indications from, you know, the governing bodies of cardiology and surgery as to which, what age sort of um, you should recommend which type of valve. And they're changing uh, over time with the, the advent of TAVR and kind of just changing indications for the TAVR valves. I think the most recent indications for um, the East in the United States are that if you're under 50 years of age, you should get a mechanical valve. If you're over 70 years of age, you should get a bioprosthetic valve. If you're between 50 and 70, then it's a kind of a about the patient's preferences and their ability to take Coumadin and things like that as well. Um, it's a little bit different in Europe, but um, those, are, those are the current recommendations in America. You know, the additional consideration, of course, is that uh, TAVR could also be used for, um, these days, for, for most large enough uh, failed bioprosthetic uh, valves. So uh, we do expect in, in a 60-year-old patient uh, who gets a bioprosthetic surgical valve um, you know, about a 15-year uh, lifespan after which a TAVR could be performed in a valve-in-valve -valve fashion to repair that uh, degenerated valve. So uh, I guess it's, it, I mean, you just, it's a demonstration of just how far technology has come because 10 years ago, we would not be even having this, it feels blasphemous to even talk about TAVR as a possibility for this, this kind of patient, this gentleman. So um, just because he was brought up, uh, let's dig in a little bit about this idea of um, you know, low-risk patients. Should we be doing TAVRs for them? I think yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to speak to that, obviously. And um, I think that a couple of teaching points is that, you know, low-risk TAVR in general, not in bicuspids, but low-risk in general is rigorously been studied and has been shown to be at least as good as surgery. Um, bicuspid patients were excluded from all of the pivotal trials that looked at TAVR compared to surgery. Nevertheless, there have been a number of observational studies in patients being treated with bicuspid aortic stenosis with TAVR, and it is FDA approved for treatment of patients with bicuspid aortic stenosis. It's not an off-label indication, but most of the data is observational. And we do have a reasonable body of data now at this point of treating bicuspid patients. And um, I think that the approach, I would mirror what Dr. Chu has said as well, but I think that approaching a patient like this who's relatively younger, you have to consider all of the clinical data about what's going on with the patient as well as anatomic data about what the valve looks like and getting in kind of the nuances of the anatomy that can make a difference. But 
I think without question, if the patient's going to get a mechanical valve that hands down beats a TAVR option, there, there's no way we can beat that in terms of durability um, because a TAVR will fail over time just as a surgical bioprosthesis will fail over time. And certainly if they need a surgical intervention for some other reason, such as an aortopathy, a grow, growing aneurysm, or if they have proximal LED disease or left main disease where they're going to get a Lima bypass graft, and I think that's a clear uh, trump card that beats TAVR. But I think uh, and in terms of the anatomic nuances that I was mentioning about bicuspids, uh, within the limitations of the observational data that we have, we know that overall all comers with bicuspid patients who are treated with TAVR compared to patients who have three leaflets treated with TAVR, they overall do about the same. All comers, they're probably a little bit higher risk of stroke um, and a little bit higher risk of paravalvular leak just because the annulus with bicuspid ends up being more ellipsoid rather than perfectly circular. And that can have implications over time because more than moderate paravalvular leak after a TAVR is associated with increased mortality. So it's definitely something that we factor in. The other anatomic things are calcified raffies are associated with uh, an increased risk of adverse events in bicuspid TAVR patients. But I think that um, you have to consider the sort of long-term plan for a patient like this who's quite young. And uh, you know, if they don't have another strong indication for surgery, say they're gonna get a lemograph, they're gonna get um, you know, the error replace of an aneurysm that's enlarging, or they have prohibitive anatomy for some other reason. And you could argue that maybe their first operation, and they're not going to get a mechanical valve for a patient preference or some other reason. Um, you could argue that maybe their first procedure should be a TAVR, which, you know, over time will degenerate as with any bioprosthesis will. And then by the time they need their second valve intervention, Perhaps they have, have some other surgical indication, like they need a lima at that time, or their thoracic aneurysm is enlarged, that maybe then they should get a surgical valve later. Uh, you know, Dr. Gelfand mentioned that we have a lot of experience in valve and valve TAVR, which we do, but in the particularly young patients, you have to think about not even the second valve, but maybe even the third valve. And so one can argue that maybe the first valve should be a TAVR, the second valve could be a surgical valve, and then way down the line, maybe the third valve is a, is a valve in valve TAVR. So I think, you know, it's certainly a nuanced and complicated decision. Uh, but again, if they're going to get a mechanical valve or they have indications for surgery that are um, otherwise unrelated to the valve, that, that it's clearly surgery is better. But I think with patients who don't have predictive anatomy or don't have a strong otherwise indication for surgery, it's really shared decision making. Yeah, I think Mark is being Mark is being a little modest as far as the the low risk trial goes. The the Tavra patients actually did um, very impressively with low risk um, with the low risk partners trial compared to the surgical patients. I think the you know, the primary outcome of death and rehospitalization um, and stroke was actually better than surgery at the one year mark. Um, now at two years, the the curves kind of come a little bit closer, where you know still a little bit better as far as the major endpoint there, but. When you look at um, death and stroke and rehospitalization alone, um, the, diff the significance, I think, drops away at two years. Um, plus, the other thing that's a little bit concerning to some people is that, you know, both at one and two years in the Lotus trial, the TAVR valves had a higher rate of um, valve thrombosis, although it wasn't uh, clinically significant at either, at either time point. Um, it remains to be seen kind of down the road, five years, seven years, eight years down the road. Um, what kind of significance that's going to hold, especially in these young patients who we know the younger the patient, the more quickly the bioprosthetic valves tend to degenerate. I think the caveat with, you know, with, with Mark mentioned as far as, you know, doing a TAVR first and then having a surgical procedure later on is that as we're starting to operate more and more on these patients who have had a TAVR before, we're finding that um, the surgical operation is made a little bit more difficult by the TAVR as opposed to reoperating on a patient who's had a previous surgical valve because of the way that the cage of the TAVR kind of gets incorporated into the aortic walls and into the root of the aorta, um, a larger percentage of these patients are requiring a root replacement, which means they kind of excise the aortic sinuses and reimplant the coronary, um, coronary arteries as buttons, which is a little bit more, um, more involved operation.
This is awesome. I wish you guys were all in the clinic room with me when I was talking to the guy. <laughs> but um, and I just want to highlight one thing that I just want to make sure is clear to all the people watching and listening that we're talking about TAVR potentially within a bioprosthetic valve, which cannot be done with a, once, there, once there's a mechanical prosthesis in place, there is no TAVR that can be placed in the setting of a mechanical prosthesis. If you want the mechanical prosthesis to be come out at some point, that requires another open surgery um, with a, you know, and then either a new mechanical valve or a bioprosthetic valve. I'd like to thank everyone for excellent discussion, just to do a little bit of summarizing. So we initially went over um, the differences between the mechanical and the bioprosthetics. Again, the main differences are in durability uh, and whether or not you need anticoagulation or not. Historically, it was really less than 55 year and 55, as we mentioned now, it's, there's a really gray zone between 50 to 70, where shared decision-making is, is very key. Um, and then some of the trials we were mentioning, the, the main valve trials um, that were in England were the partner trials. Um, they, the first one, partner B, actually came out before partner A in 2010, compared TAVRs to patients who could not get surgery at all. Um, and then partner A came out the year later, which compared them to high-risk patients. Um, partner two uh, came out in 2016, who compared um, surgical valves with, um, to TAVRs and intermediate risk patients. And then partner three came out last year in 2019. And all those showed either um, non-inferiority or some trends towards um, kind of preference towards TAVRs. Um, and again, the key thing is that partner three that came out um, last year is the, is the freshest of the trials. It was low risk and the, the majority of patients are low risk. It's not evenly distributed like a third, a third, a third uh, between the high, intermediate and low risk patients. Um, and then as we were really mentioning, comparing surgical valves with TAVRs, um, the durability is really a, a key difference. Um, TAVRs, um, are known to last for at least five years, but expected to last a little bit longer, although not as long as the surgical valves. And here is just summarizing some of the data from the latest partner three trial, um, comparing low risk patients and some of the key differences. Um, again, the composite outcome at one year uh, was in favor of TAVRs. Uh, again, the two year outcomes have been uh, a little more mixed. Um, there is higher paraprocedural mor morbidity uh, with the surgical valves, uh, in particular, the risk of um, overall mortality and stroke was 3.3% compared to 1%. Uh, major bleeding was 25% compared to 4%. And new AFib was 40% compared to 5%. However, TAVRs, again, did have the extra um, risk of, um, of clot formation um, on the valve. And then um, new heart block um, that we're all aware of covering in the CCU after TAVR Tuesdays um, does come up at a higher rate. Um, and again, the, the most recent guidelines able to find from 2017 um, really have intermediate risk um, patients in who can really go either surgical or TAVRs. Um, but notably, this is 2017 uh, before partner uh, three really came to fruition. Look for new guidelines coming out uh, early next year. Looking forward to it. Um, and this was a, a recent paper came out that was just supporting some of the discussion about um, the increased risk of calcification uh, on bicuspid valves. Um, and so I think most of the learning points there, uh, to probably send it back to uh, Dr. Matos to talk about what happened with, with our patient. Yeah, so um, I, I referred the patient to, to Dr. Chu um, to discuss surgical options. I, I felt with how calcified his valve was and how young he was, um, that I, I thought surgery would be, we sort of have the, I know we have very good data with TAVR, but I, I, I haven't sent the patient this healthy and young for a tower before in my, I just wasn't comfortable doing that. Um, and Plus he gets the um, Lima. Well, I, I didn't actually know at the time yet he needed the Lima actually. Um, but in the, I guess once we knew he needed the Lima, all I sort of confirmed, I guess, solidified the decision. Um, and then ultimately, uh, Dr. Chu moved forward and, and went with a bioprosthetic aortic valve replacement and, and had the Lima placed to the LAD. And so, Lewis, how does his aorta look? His aorta was fine. It was a little bit thinner than I would have expected in a, such a young person. Um, but, uh, you know, as the CT scan measured, it was less than you know, four centimeters. Generally, if there's anything, if the aorta is larger than 4.5 centimeters at the time they were going in for another valve, uh, any operation, whether it's a valve operation or a cabinet or something else, um, we'll, we'll consider replacing the aorta. Um, but for him, because it's under four centimeters, we left it alone. Yeah, maybe I can ask all the consultants how they, uh, how do they typically approach counseling patients with bicuspid aortic valves about uh, screening their first degree relatives or family and uh, 
you know, the, the, the guidelines really don't suggest uh, screening at this point, um, but uh, uh, knowing the genetics, what, what, what do people do in clinic? I tell everyone to get the first degree relatives to get an echo. I think, you know, whether or not that's on a system basis, whether that's strain and healthcare costs, it's a non-invasive test. And I think that, it, you know, if you can catch someone and identify something and then follow it over time, I think that's a benefit. All right. Um, there's any other um, comments before we do a final summary over the case? Uh, yeah, I want to make a comment just about the durability. Uh, I think it's a really, this comes up all the time with TAVR, which is a, a really excellent point that the, you know, these TAVR hasn't been around for very long, and particularly the, the early trials that evaluated TAVR were in extreme risk patients who likely didn't survive because of their other comorbidities. So we don't necessarily have a lot of long-term data about the durability of TAVR valves, but we do have some at this point, and I think it will continue to grow over time. And you know, there's a recent study of, of uh, registry study of, of patients with TAVR, and you know they have really good data up to five to eight years without significant structural valve degeneration. I'd like to thank everyone for for joining us. Just a quick uh, couple summary points. Um, so some take-home points for people at home. So symptomatic aortic stenosis um, certainly progresses quickly. We reviewed the three, uh, the five, three, and two. Um, your life expectancies once symptoms develop based on angina, syncope, and, and heart failure symptoms. Um, asymptomatic aortic stenosis touched on briefly that also requires screening. Uh, intervals is mild, usually three to five years, moderate about every two, and severe every one. Um, bicuspid valves, again, my key learning point are part of the larger bicuspid valve uh, aortopathy, and they do require some more frequent screening. And then we briefly um, touched on as well um, the consideration for family member screening uh, for patients diagnosed with it. Um, mechanical valves have been uh, the gold standard for a while, and they last 30 plus years and traditionally providing younger, healthier patients. However, they do have higher uh, procedural risk and do require lifelong anticoagulation. Um, bioprosthetics um, also have had uh, improved durability around 15 plus years and do not require anticoagulation. And then TAVRs have really come on in the last um, 10 years in particular, um, initially developed for primarily high risk elderly patients in the original partner trials, but then they've had strong data in the low risk groups as well um, and are having improving durability. Um, so I'd like to thank again everyone for joining us. Um, I guess until next time on our next episode of uh, Zoltz Center. <laughs>